In an age where 3D was becoming all the rage, Kirby decided to just... not even try. They made another Super Nintendo game instead. And when tasked to actually move on to the N64, Kirby still stuck to its 2D roots. Ultimately, I think this was done for simplicity's sake. Kirby could suddenly be much more complicated when introducing a Z-axis. Aiming when spitting out an enemy, for example, isn't quite as straightforward as it would be on a 2D plane. Just think of any first-person shooter you've probably played. There's a skill involved with that that isn't necessarily Kirby's focus. And while it doesn't have to be, I think it was best to keep Kirby 2D. At least at the time. Kirby 64 is more of a 2.5D game, and because of that, it was still something accessible to newer players. Teaching a player 3D movement isn't as easy to explain when compared to just moving left and right, especially back when I was still relatively new and designers were still trying to figure things out. The 2.5D perspective still kept that accessibility while allowing for a 3D space to, you know, keep up with the times and show gamers dumb graphics. But hey, the N64 was still relevant when the Crystal Shores was released, so at least they learned their lesson when it comes to the main series. Despite that initial archaicness at the time, Kirby 64 The Crystal Shards is a pretty well-liked entry to my knowledge. Mainly because it introduces this one-time gimmick of being able to combine abilities, which sounds rad as hell. But personally, I never cared for Kirby 64 that much. I played it once when I got in the Dream Collection, felt unimpressed, and never touched it again. The main issues I remember having were how clunky ability combos were and the game being oddly difficult. I didn't even bother getting all the collectibles like I normally do in these games. I was just left feeling indifferent. I didn't hate it, I didn't love it, I merely consumed it. But I haven't touched the game since I was 14, so I'm hoping I like it a lot more this time. There's no way I'll go crazy playing this game like last time. Right? Ah, uh, isn't this wonderful planet of Ribble Star so wonderful? Well, it's possessed by Dark Matter now, and everything is eerie and sad. But luckily, their queen sent off this new character named Ribbon to, I think, protect this giant crystal, which she fails at and is scattered around the nearby planets, one of which happens to be Popstar. But Ribbon runs into Kirby, who's more than happy to help out. So from there, we literally do the exact same thing we did last time and rid Dark Matter from Popstar. What took an entire game to do before? now takes three levels and a boss. All of his friends get possessed with almost comedic timing, too. Oh, looks like Dark Matter is up to no good again. Not today, kiddo. So, like, apparently all Waddle Doos come from Dark Matter? What? Okay. Also, why is a freaking Waddle Doo a boss? That's so stupid, I love it. So, after beating up all of Kirby's friends, it's up to Ribbon, Adeline, Dedede, and a generic Waddle Dee to watch from the sidelines as Kirby almost single-handedly rids Dark Matter from the entire soul system. So, you know, business as usual. Kirby 64 is the last game and what's referred to as the Dark Matter trilogy, just being the games where Dark Matter is a big immediate threat. Because of that, you could say Kirby 64 is almost a dreamland for, at least in terms of story. The gameplay, not so much. And yeah, Kirby 64 is a 2D game on the N64. Using the D-pad for an N64 game just feels so... wrong. I know there's other 2D side-scrollers on the system, but there are so few of them that it just feels weird to me. This D-pad might be one of the most unused things of all time. Even Stadia got more use, which is just sad. Most side-scrollers moved to the PlayStation during this era, probably because it didn't have an analog stick for a good chunk of his life. Playing a 3D game without an analog stick just feels unintuitive, and 2D games tend to control better with a D-pad. Just look at Mario 64 versus Mario 64 DS. Kirby 64 at least makes use of the 3D background, but I just can't get over playing a 2D game on this system. It feels so unnatural. Another oddity about this game is how Kirby actually has limited flight this time. He's basically been reduced to how Tails works. If he's flying for too long, he gets tired and unpuffs. It's an odd decision at first, but I actually ended up really liking it. Because, you see, Kirby was never really known for the platforming, and seeing how he can just fly over pretty much everything if you wanted to, that makes sense. But because flight is limited now, I ended up only using it when I needed it, making it feel like less of a crutch. So, the Crystal Shards has a lot more platforming than most Kirby games, and I ended up really enjoying that. Kirby even has this little grabbing animation to jump up certain platforms or off small ones. It's just this automatic thing that makes the game flow better. I really like the ports where you jumping from platform to platform or pole to pole and play the game like a typical platformer. You don't normally get this kind of fun from Kirby, so it's really nice to have one that feels like a fun, jumpy game. 
I'm sure you already know what the main new mechanic of Kirby 64 is though. This time, you have 7 base abilities, but you can combine your current ability with another one to give you something new entirely. While Cutter on his own is the standard Cutter we all know and love. Aside from the horrifying revelation that Kirby is flinging half his body as an attack, Needle Cutter is this jaw-biting move, where Fire Cutter is a giant great soul that's on fire, where Bomb Cutter is a shuriken that explodes on impact, or Electric Cutter is a freaking lightsaber. I know that the Phantom Menace came out a few years prior, but jeez guys, you like Darth Maul, we get it. Honestly, this is a badass idea. It's like Pokemon fusions, everyone wants to know what fusing abilities together would look like, and here it is. It definitely improves the replayability too, it's fun to mix and match abilities to see what I get. But this system is pretty clunky in execution, it's just all the small things about it. Mainly because in order to fuse abilities, you have to get rid of your current one, throw down another enemy with an ability, and then suck it back up. Once you get used to that, I don't mind it, but it can be so much more fluid than what it currently is. Because this whole throwing thing is so unnecessary. Why can't there be a button to inhale while you have an open ability slot? The C button is just get rid of your abilities, so why not use one of those? Think still being able to use your Mega Buster while we have a weapon selected in X4. And what if I only want to get rid of one ability? I'll get into the oddly specific requirements of the collectibles later, but for now, some of them need a specific ability combo. So so if you have both slots full, you have to get rid of either both or neither. All the triggers seem to do is get rid of your abilities, so why can't ZL just get rid of the left ability and all get rid of the right, along with one of the C buttons getting rid of both? Just having a few more options would make this less cumbersome. To be clear, I don't hate this system like I did when I first played it. In fact, I really like this. It leads to some really cool and unique abilities. My favorite of which was probably Bomb Cutter. It's a shuriken that explodes on contact, that's badass. Really good against bosses, too. Needle was oddly useful this time around. The range on this thing is much better than in previous games, and all of his mixes are great, too. Fire arrows, exploding gordos, a lightning rod, Rock Needle even gives you a drill. I love this one, I really wish it would make a comeback. Using a drill as a weapon with a full moveset sounds so cool. Doubling up your abilities usually turns into a more powerful version of itself, to. Double Spark and Double Needle just have a ton of range. I also like how Stone has a little explosion afterwards. That improves his usability quite a bit. There are plenty of useless combos though, like Ice Fire just forms an ice cube around that instantly melts. Yeah, it does damage enemies, but the range is so low that I'd rather use one or the other. And Spoke Fire just sets you on fire. Same issue, the range is too small. Spoke Ice turns you into a fridge, which is really creative, but mostly used to heal yourself, not so much do any real damage. The weirdest one for me is Double Fire, because it's just a better version of fire, but you can't stop whenever you want, so I ended up running into a lot of stuff. Despite Mono Fire being worse, the shorter range gave me better control, which made me prefer that. Just pressing B again to stop would have been nice. Rock Bomb seems useless because the blast damages you when you arrange the explosion, and it's really hard to actually get out of the range of that explosion, but it turns out that pressing down B will shield you from the damage. Yeah, cool, that would've been nice to know. Not having a descriptor on the pause screen wasn't a problem in Dreamland 2 and 3D because those abilities only did one thing. But there's a few outliers that have 2 or 3 attacks, so having a description on the pause screen almost feels required in 64. It feels like there's information I'm completely missing. But unlike the buddy system, most mix abilities are perfectly usable, so that alone makes the system much more enjoyable for me. The only big annoyance with the playability this time is that Kirby no longer has a standard health bar and we're back to the 6 hits and you're dead system. Why? Just having a health bar is better, to be honest. Even Dreamland 3 did that, even if it was stylized to look like you had 5 hits. But luckily, they give you so many health items that it's only an annoyance, not so much an issue. The game is called Crystal Shards, though, so what's up with those? Well, it's the main collectible in this game. There's three in each level, which feels so much better than just having a single collectible. If I have to replay a level to get something I missed, that doesn't sing nearly as much as going back for one thing right at the end of the level. And once you collect a shard, you can just exit the level instead of going through the remainder of it. But for some reason, exit level is labeled Try Again. I don't understand why. It doesn't restore the level, it exits it. The really nice thing about the shards is that on the level select, it tells you exactly which ones you found. So if you have the first and third ones, you know that the second one is in between those two points. Think new Super Mario Bros. It's a really nice way of telling you where it is without revealing where it is exactly. I like that. So yeah, these are the best collectibles up to this point in the series. Although they don't do anything except unlock the true ending and real final boss, so if you missed one, you might as well have missed half of them. I was really enjoying trying to find all these shards, so much that I was starting to wonder why I never bothered 100%ing this game back in the day. 
But then I realized why. There's so many of them that feel so arbitrary. Often, you need the right ability combo to break specific blocks, and it's just... Why? Why does this specific combo break this, but nothing else? What's the point in making me track down specific enemies to get this? At least there's usually an indication of what you're supposed to do. Like this black and blue block means you need Ice Bomb, or this brown and yellow block means you need Sparkstone. But it's so subtle that I didn't catch on until the third or fourth time this happened. I can do it once I figure that out, but it feels like it's padding out the game for no reason. Especially since the abilities you need are either not the stage or past the point where we need them, so we need to replay the level anyway. Why can't they just be somewhat close to where they're required? You can't possibly know you need them until you actually do. And yeah, I can ignore crystal shards, but then I get the bad ending. Although I didn't mind having to get all the shards nearly as much as getting all the heart stars. It's still enjoyable, but not as enjoyable as it could be. Why not require you to only need one of those two abilities? It would make it feel less forced. But there are a few shards that are a pain in the ass no matter what you do. Like this one, where for some reason you need double ice, but there's no indication that's what you need to do. Or this one, where you need double fire, but it's likely you'll exit the room when you kill the mini boss with double fire, and the shard's gone when you re enter the room. You can at least get the shard before defeating the mini boss, but like. Come on, that's kind of a dick move. Or this one, while you light up the room around you with Spoke Bomb, but the issue is you might not know that's what you need to do. I didn't know Spoke Bomb was a light bulb, and that doesn't exactly scream light bulb to me, so I would have no reason to try that unless I actually knew about it. Sure, it's fine once you know what that combo is, but you likely won't, which is my issue with it. The most cryptic shard has to be the one where you draw a shape of the blocks, mainly because I don't know what the game is looking for. Like, yeah, umbrella, sure, but it's more like an arrow, which I wouldn't have been able to figure out on my own. There's only one pattern that works, so I feel like there should have been less complex shapes or something to make it easier. And there's three different shapes that can come up, which makes it harder to find a decent guide for it. But easily the worst show in the game is the one that needs Rock Cutter. There's this giant shaft that you have to climb up, which sounds easy, until you remember that flight is limited in this game. So, what do you do? Well, you need a Rock Cutter to get in here, which is a pretty neat ability. You carve animal buddies out of the rocks. That's a neat old little easter egg. But apparently you also gain the ability to climb up walls as Rick, which the game doesn't tell you about. Descriptions on the pause screen, for the love of god. It solves so many issues, and it was already there in the previous games. And seriously, why are some of these things so annoying and cryptic to get? This is the third game where this is an issue, you'd think they would have learned by now. They did learn how to make cool levels though. I had a blast going through them this time. Pop Store is pretty basic, a standard first world kind of thing. But I really like this autumn aesthetic in the second stage. It just looks really nice. Rock Store mostly feels like standard desert world with some cool ruins, but it ends with you going through this floating pyramid UFO thing, which I wasn't expecting. Like, this is so cool looking, dude. I don't even know what's going on in Neo Store though. You start off in a jungle, go through some mines, end up in mountains that somehow spell out Kirby, and run through a volcano. Sure, that was neat. Shiver Star was probably my favorite ward in the game. I don't know why, I've always liked ice levels when there aren't ice physics. I'm that weirdo that actually likes cold weather, so they've always felt so cozy to me. But you also go up into the clouds and let's do an awesome butter building remix and go through. What is this, a mall? That's weird. There's this factory too, with stuff in test tubes? And the boss is a giant robot? Hold on, we passed through some houses on the way here. What does this place look like again? Oh. What is it with Nintendo games and secretly being on a post-apocalyptic Earth? Okay, to be fair, Shiver Store being Earth is just a fan theory, but come on, this almost feels intentional. Kinda sucks that my favorite world in the game is followed up by such a boring one. You go to a Dark Matter controlled Rebel Store, which is really cool. It's just really boring. All you do is go through some plains, caves, and fight some enemies. It doesn't even have the usual four stages either. It's oddly underwhelming. But at least it's not Aqua Star. Water sections in Kirby have never been annoying, except in Dreamland 3, but why do they have to make this one so irritating? You slowly go through these water sections and it's like, can we move things along, please? Uh, okay, we have currents now, that's better. Uh, okay, okay, we're too fast now. I, I, just, I just want the shard, man. Please let me move on with my life. I'm playing the Wii version of the game, I miss save states. No particular reason why, it's just the only copy of the game I happen to have.
that was the only part of the game that was an outright slog, so I'm moving on to the bosses, which are weirdly awesome. Even Woodsby Woods, which has this cool perspective around him and you have to hit his roots. It's neat. You fight this alien polygon computer thing in Rockstar too. That's a really cool idea, even if the dodging his attacks phase takes a bit too long. Then you fight Acro again, which was a Dreamland 3 boss, and he's the easiest boss in the game, weirdly enough. Like, it's impressive to be easier than Wispy Woods. This dumb whale should get an award or something. Magman has a cool idea where you fight the lava itself, but again, nothing too noteworthy about him. The HRH robot I mentioned earlier is legitimately one of the best fights in the series because it feels like this big menacing boss. It's hard, too. It took me a few tries. This feels like an actual test of your skills for once, which I really like. And it's got two phases, too. That's just a cherry on top. But none of these bosses hold a can or the normal final boss. Miracle matter. This thing has seven forms, one for each of Kirby's abilities in this game, and it can only be hit with the ability that it currently has. So we have a boss that actually tests your flexibility with using different copy abilities. I love that. And this is probably the hardest required boss in the series, too. This took me quite a few tries. I liked fighting this dude so much that I didn't mind having to beat him a second time to get footage of both endings. And I don't usually like the concept of bad endings. You know, you technically beat the game, but you didn't do some arbitrary extra thing, so it's not as good of an ending as you could have had. But if you don't collect every crystal shard before defeating Miracle Matter, everything seems fine until... God, that is so good. Some random hint out of nowhere, the things aren't quite sunshine and rainbows. Dude, that sent chills down my spine, especially since you only get to see it while it fades to black. I wasn't expecting something so subtly dark in a game like this, and this is coming from a series with bleeding eyeballs for final bosses and cult leaders for villains. You'd think I was making that last one up, but no, why am I surprised about this? The only way this could have been any better is if it didn't cut to this music. <laughs> And then everyone died. The end. But if you actually got all the crystal shards, you purge the final bit of dark matter out of the queen, which makes a giant ominous cloud of darkness in the sky. So Kirby calls up a warp star, which is a thing he can do apparently, goes through the world map of Super Metroid, and ends up in some weird void to fight Zero 2, a reborn version of Zero from Dreamland 3, because you can't have a character named Zero without bringing them back to life. But anyway, we've gotta deal with this fallen angel thing. So you shoot his eyes with crystals, and it bleeds so much that it's stunned so you can hit its halo, which then reveals its fine tail thing so that you can damage it. Seriously man, what even is this thing? It's a really easy boss, but the perspective is weird. You move in a sphere around Zero, but I didn't realize that until I noticed the background moving with me. Once I realized that, it was easy. It just didn't convey that it was in a 3D space very well. I saw the camera as being in a fixed position, like in Star Fox or something. The actual ending is alright though, everyone gets a medal from the Rebel Star Queen, and the day is saved. Yay. Look, I know someone with influence clearly loves Star Wars already, but now you're making things a bit too obvious. Oh yeah, I guess I should bring up the director. Shinichi Shimamura directed a few Kirby games, with the last one being Nightmare in Dreamland, and just seemingly disappeared off the face of the earth. No one knows what happened to him, no one even knows what he looks like, this is just some random stock image. It's incredibly bizarre, did he not like game development? You don't just direct multiple well-received, well-selling games and don't continue. It was apparently a rumor he died, but that's just a rumor. Considering he only worked on kid-friendly games, it makes his son disappear all the more creepy. It's like if Koizumi or someone similar just noped out of game development for some reason. They had a lot to say in the direction of a popular series and disappeared afterwards. I hope he's okay, but I gotta be honest, I'm kinda worried about him. On a lighter note, there's some sub-games to check out. They're all multiplayer time wasters, really, nothing noteworthy. And yeah, these support up to four players, which really makes you wish co-op was still in the game. Seriously, of all times to get rid of co-op, why did it have to be on arguably the best local multiplayer machine ever made? The N64 had Goldeneye, Mario Kart, Diddy Kong Racing, Mario Party, even single-player games had really good multiplayer modes. Come on, guys, why now of all times did you gut the co-op? I mean... At least there's a boss rush to vent my frustrations on. Why is it the adventure version again? Yep, fight all the bosses in a row without healing items or abilities, have fun. But to be fair, Dreamland 3 did this too, but also to be fair, Superstore did it miles better. 
I feel like I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but it really does feel like they're ignoring Superstore's existence for some reason. There's also these cards you can collect on the goal game, but they don't do anything. You're not missing much by not going for them. Kirby 64's got its issues, but there's a lot to love this time. I can see why it's so beloved, even if it's not one of my favorites. Because seriously, despite how clunky the execution is at times, combining abilities together is really cool. I was surprised by how good the platforming is this time, too. You even play as DDD in a few sections. While collecting all the crystal shards can be a pain in the ass at points, Kirby 64 is actually satisfying to finish without that. And even then, it's not infuriating or anything, just not as good as it could have been. You know, it's been a while since the last Kirby remake. If they ever remade another one, I'd like to see a remake of Kirby 64, because it's so close to being a fantastic game. But it's just great, and that's it. Not that that's a bad thing. Kirby 64 is a bit harder to get your hands on, because Nintendo seems to be allergic to re-releasing anything past Super Nintendo, unless it's a limited time only for some reason. But it's both dragging down or downloading even got a Wii or Wii U. Kirby never did try doing a 3D main entry, though. I'm really curious as to what that would be like. Sure, not all games work well in 3D, but at least games like Mega Man X and Castlevania tried. Kirby never tried to do a 3D game, and it makes me wonder what could have been. Kirby's felt a little samey lately, so maybe for the next entry they could try that. But I'm getting way ahead of myself, because that's gonna be it with Kirby for me. I wanted to go to Air Ride for this marathon, you know, ending it with the last game Sakurai was involved with, but I don't have it, and 2020's been a mess, and I haven't had much spending money, so that's gonna have to wait until next time, who knows how long from now. But hey, ending off the Dark Matter trilogy is just as good of a stopping point. It's been fun revisiting these, even if it wasn't always positive. I've already decided what I'm doing next on the channel, so until then, this has been Flame Guy. Take care, and I'll see you all next mission.